Hello everyone, I'm Elias. Uh, with Ivan, we have, we've done some research on TSN and how we can use XDP to, and leverage XDP for that. So, which one of you knows what XDP is? All right, which of know, one of you knows what TSN is? TSN is time-sensitive networking. I'll do, okay, so I'll do the introduction. TSN is time-sensitive networking and it's supposed to be a framework that we can use for packets that should be delivered in time and not out of a specific time schedule. XDP uh, is an express data path on the kernel. So it's a building block that you can use and build a bunch of applications on it. It's, it mostly oper it operates on layer two and layer three only. And you need to think of it as a, as a kernel bypass. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, not as a kernel bypass, but a fast path in kernel. One of the features that it offers is a kernel bypass, but it's a feature, it's not the complete uh, set of it. Uh, it operates on a driver basis, so you need to edit the driver and you need to have a working driver for XDP in order to get the functionality. And there's various modes that you can edit and there's various functionalities you can get, we'll cover them in a bit. Uh, the good thing is that there's a native XDP implementation which doesn't offer the speed, so the speed improvements, but it does work on every working existing driver on the Linux kernel. So if you want to experiment with it, if you want to play around with it, it's usable on any interface. Uh, the last thing that you really need to figure out is that think XDP as a building block. It doesn't offer anything as a specific, as a technology on its own, but it's a great building block for doing a bunch of stuff. So uh, when you start XDP and when you start to change the driver, you have these actions. Uh, XDP pass means send the, send the packet back to the Linux networking stack for whatever processing the network stack was gonna make anyway. Uh, so how, this, how XDP works is that you load a BPF program, a program of BPF on the driver, and depending on the outcome of the BPF program, you might either get an XDP pass, which means send the packet to the, to, the, to the kernel. You might get an XDP drop, which means drop all the packets that match the BPF program. You might get an XDP redirect, and the redirect means redirect the packet on a different CPU or anything that your user space application does your BPF application does, and you have XDPTX. Now, XDPTX is a bit weird, but essentially you send out the packet through the interface it came from. So you can, for example, switch, switch the MAC headers, switch to the source and destination address, and just send it immediately out of the interface without paying the price of processing the packet in the Linux kernel. So this is pretty much an overview of how XDP works. Uh, if you have two network interfaces, and a packet comes in from network interface one, and the action is XDPTX, the packet will be changed and it will go out through NIC interface one again. Uh, if the packet, uh, if the action is an XDP pass, it will go to the Linux networking stuff. Uh, if it's an, a redirect, there's a callback that we use which is called NDO XDPX meet and you can send the packet to a different network interface within the same host without processing it from the Linux network stack. That, that's what speeds up things that much. You don't go through the network stack, you don't pay a bunch of price for traffic saving or what IP tables, whatever Linux is doing. You're just redirecting it through a, through a second interface. Now, on 4.18, we get a new sinkhole, which was called AFXDP. Now, the AFXDP is a, an offload to user space that you can use. You have generic XDP, which we mentioned that if the driver doesn't have any XDP support, you can use it and test every functionality you want. The, the, the obvious problem is that you don't get any speed improvement that XDP offers because you're using the standard Linux uh, network stack to emulate what XDP would do. Now, the next step is native XDP. <coughs> native XDP offers a really good performance on RX but it doesn't change anything on the TX. Uh, and then you have zero copy. The zero copy, mode is, uh, zero copy mode on AFXDP is essentially where you allocate the buffers for the network interface card from the user space. So since you offload all the traffic to user space, you can, you can use those buffers for either RX or TX. You don't have to copy the buffers. XDP works on both directions, and that's, what you get, that's where you get all the speed improvements for. The zero copy AFXDP mode is the mode that works really, really fast. So compared to the previous slide, 
this is where XDP fits in. So when you have a packet on th that's destined for the user space, you can just send it directly on a socket and bypass the whole kernel, Linux kernel network stack. Now, the XDP killer feature, because there's been a bunch of applications doing that, there's, there's been DPDK, there's been Maglev from Google, there's been a bunch of proposals doing that. There's open load from SolarFlare. Now, the killer feature is that this is eBPF programmable, so you can choose which packets to forward to user space, you can choose which packets you will need to drop or redirect to the user space, and you don't need any proprietary SDK or in user space SDK. You just get the kernel, and if, if it's supported by your driver, you're good to go. Now, why did we even consider XDP for TSN? Now, as we discussed, TSN is a time-sensitive networking that needs a bounded latency and a bounded jitter. You need to be able to determine both of them in order to have a time-sensitive networking. Uh, XDP can't guarantee jitter. The only thing you can get out of XDP is that, is that you get really low latency compared to what the Linux net network stack does. So on, pre on previous Ivan measurements that we had on previous connects about speeds on XDP, we were getting like 60 to 70 micros uh, microseconds from kernel space to user space as a packet processing. And now we're getting below 10 microseconds just by using XDP and from the drive, yeah, from the hardware to user space. We'll, you'll explain this part. Uh, but the, the initial latency measurements that we see compared to what the Linux network stack does are really improved, and this is really what's driving us to move forward. Uh, the thing is that you can't guarantee jitter, but there's various tricks you can do to guarantee jitter. For example, you can pin various CPUs, you can use you can isolate CPUs from the Linux kernel and you, you can run your user space applications on the isolated CPUs. So there's, there's, currently there are some tricks you can do to try and guarantee jitter, but there ne still needs work to be done over there. Uh, now the good part with XDP, we mentioned that, is that since it relies on BPF to figure out which packets it should offload, which packets it should send back to user space or back to the kernel or redirect, uh, since this is programmable, you can control your traffic really well because you can have your uh, really sensitive traffic going out of directly to the user space and you can have your non-sensitive traffic uh, thrown back to the kernel. So the kernel will do the processing for you, it will do whatever you have to do, and you will have all the, um, all the sensitive traffic offloaded. Uh, the next thing is, th is that it's currently designed to operate as a socket. So you, all the things that you know on sockets, you open a socket, and on that socket you just receive layer two frames. That's how the functionality works at the moment, and this is pretty much standardized. It's not going to change. Uh, we've also done some tests with user space libraries that do TCP IP like LWAP, uh, VPP, and this is working really well at the moment. And, We've, all, all we've done at the moment is prototype work. We haven't optimized the code too much. There's still much work to be done, but the first step seems to be really interesting. Uh, okay, we, we still have features merged. For example, as I, as I told you, in order to make F XDP work, you need a BPF program loaded in the driver. Right now, we only support a BPF program per network interface. Future work says that we're going to support a BPF program per queue. So for every hardware queue that you have, you're going to have a, a BPF program doing the processing for you. So this is going to get even more granular. Uh, for the XTP work we did, for the TSN work we did and the measurements, we figured out that if you need really low latency, you're going to have to do poll mode, and you're probably going to have to run with interrupts disabled, and you're probably going to have to try and avoid any MMIO access or any uncast memory accesses that you need because you, there are some graphs following up that show the latency and you'll figure out that this, all these stuff are hurting latency really, really bad. Uh, we, unfortunately, we don't have a driver to test zero copy on because zero copy is a bit tricky to get it correctly working at the moment. And the only driver supporting it is the 10 and 40 gigabit Intel network interfaces. So there's no support for low-end drivers for it. There's, there's some support for low-end drivers on XDP only, but without zero copy. Um, okay, so how we did the measurements. Uh, on the previous work that we did, when we tried to measure SKB latencies, SKB has a, some meta that SKB is the socket buffer on the Linux kernel. So 
The SKB has some metadata that already carry timestamps. They carry hardware timestamps, so you can figure out that what the timestamp was when the packet entered the network interface, and you can compare that to the timestamp of the user space the moment you receive the packet. So you know how much time the packet takes from the hardware to the user space. Unfortunately, XTP doesn't have an a, a similar infrastructure at the moment. But it, it does have a header that we can piggyback because it's 32 unused bytes at the moment, so we can use that headroom to insert the timestamp. So we pretty much have the same effect. The bad part is that we have to hack the driver in order to get that. So the idea is that you insert the timestamp there, and when the packet arrives to the user space, you get a fresh timestamp. You compare the two timestamps, and you know how much time the packet took from the car network card to the user space. Uh, if the hardware supports timestamps, this is great because you can, you can find the latency of the full path. So if you have hardware timestamps on the network interface, you insert the hardware timestamp and you get the full path delay. By full path, we mean how much time the time took, that the packet took from the hardware down to user space. If your hardware doesn't support timestamps, then you have to insert the software one. And you're going to get less accurate because you won't count in the Internet timing, you won't count, count in the software internet timing, but you'll still get an approximation of how much time the network, the network stack needs to process the packet. So we did some initial tests on a, on a Cortex-A53. Uh, unfortunately, the, ha the hardware we did the tests on didn't have any timestamps, so we couldn't measure the full path delay that we mentioned. We could only measure the delay from the network stack, from the driver stack down to user space. Uh, the, we did two tests. The first one was 10,000 packets, sending 1,000 packets per second, and the second one was 30,000 packets, sending at, at a rate of 5,000 packets per second. Uh, the first one is with the interface fully working. So as you can see, we got an average delay of, 30, of three, almost three microseconds, and we had the peak delay of 16 microseconds. Uh, the, next, the next entry you see when, it's, uh, when it says polling mode, it's a, it's a mode that we disabled the MMI access from the hardware. It was a hardware that we could do that. It didn't hurt the general operation of the hardware, and we could actually measure the difference that made. So as you can see, the latency dropped down by a lot. Uh, the peak latency is random because you, you, you still have random jitter, as we explained, and we haven't figured that part out. But the, the average latency went down by, by a microsecond just by disabling the MMIO accesses. And it was a single MMIO access for, for 16 packets. Uh, and as you can see, the results are similar to when we tried 30,000 packets at a rate of 5,000 packets per second and at a rate with MMIO accesses enabled and disabled again. Um, the reason the 30,000 packets, 5,000, uh, the 30,000 packet at a 5K Rate, rate limit was lower is that probably the caches were hotter at that point, so you could process packets faster. So this is a graph. Okay, I don't know if this is if this is showing up. This is tiny nanoseconds that you see, and this is the packets that you receive. So this is 10,000 packets and at 1,000 packet rate. Uh, the red dots that you see on the on the slide means that this is above five five microseconds. The yellow ones are between five and two microseconds, and everything that you see green is below two microseconds. As you can see, there's no green here. And on this slide, this is with the MMIO access is disabled. So the graph got a lot better here. You still have some random red dots on the jumps and the latency. But as you can see, compared to the previous slide, you do have pa many packets below two microseconds on, on the time that they need from the kernel space down to user space. And this is the similar result on 30,000 packets at a rate of 5,000 packets per second. Again, as you can see, there's no packet below two microseconds at the moment. And the moment you disable MMIO accesses to, un to uncast memory, there's a bunch of packets below two microseconds. Uh, how much time do we have? Excuse me. Ivan. Four minutes. All right. Uh, you can pick it up from now, and we can have the questions. Okay. Yeah. Pick it up, and we can leave the rest of the time for questions. Yeah. So, um, how how we actually do measurements um, using something like this test model when we have 
uh, some board that has hardware time stamping. In our case, it's AM572 TI board with Cortex A15. And um, having those hardware time stamps and software time stamps, we can you know, do the difference and calculate actually packet takes from in the driver itself and from the til til the driver from from the driver till the user space. Um, this is a basic scheme for this. And uh, usually I do measurements for mainline kernel, but this time I just decided to do measurements for RT kernel. And the closest one I found in TI it was 4.19. I can apply my IFXDP changes in this and uh, uh, and do measurements. So. Uh, for, for, for comparison, one second, I just can, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so for comparison, I just, um, uh, for, for, for my line, not, not at the kernel, I have less latency usually than I have for this, uh, this one, because it's not, it's still migrating from lower numbers, so we, 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 we usually have about on, on 10, 15 microseconds less for driver. For this stack, uh, for FXDP stack, I mean that it's from the packet leaves driver to the moment it received in the user space. And um, in case, and it's software polling, uh, actually we do measurements not only for software poll, that means that we're just constantly polling uh, hardware queue, uh, sorry, not hardware queue, uh, FXDP queue, receive queue, and um, uh, also, we have measurements when we when we use uh, system poll. I mean, when we just wait once scheduler wake us and we can receive some packet. Uh, and uh, here, for comparison, because IFXDP socket basically it's row socket type, so we decided to do some comparison with RF packet socket type. And uh, here, only 128 pps and 1 pps. It's you know small rates because we, we, we have actually measurements for higher rates, but for TSN, it's important also to have some measurements for, for low rates, like 1 PPS and 128 for this case. And it very depends on um, latencies. Uh, latencies very depend on uh, uh, rate we use for this. So for instance, when we have uh, IF XDP socket, uh, we have uh, uh, for stack latency, about eight microsecond. It's Cortex A15, not, uh, it's 32 bit with one gigahertz and I have two CPUs and increased priority for application. Uh, I, I didn't do any uh, CPU pinning uh, or stuff like this because I have limited you know, number of CPUs. So we have eight, eight microseconds for 128 PPS and uh, just when, for one PPS, it's increased in two microseconds. It's average latency, it's not peak latency. <coughs> it's a plot actually for driver and, and stack latency, 100,000 packets uh, with <coughs> 128 PPS. So uh, actually, yeah, you can see that we have, we still have some peaks, and uh, that's because we, you know, we don't use any CPU pinning, and uh, for the driver, we also have increased latency because we, we can't assign uh, higher priority for <coughs> software interrupt than, than used with this CPU for, <coughs> for, for application itself. So it's software pool. Uh, also, we have dispersion of this for a software pool. Uh, <clears throat> complete latency, it's, it means that from the very beginning, packet arrives on the interface and received in user space. It's complete latency. And, uh, yeah. It's a similar one, but for one PPS. So we can see that it's higher for one PPS. And it's, yeah, so. More, more, more disparate on, 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 it's on bigger rate. It's the same effect that we had on the previous hardware. The more, the more packets you send, the latency decreases because you keep the caches hotter. So 
how many packets per second you send does matter on latency at the moment, and it's one of the things yeah, we so need to figure out. If, if you, we, we can increase in 1,000 PPS, in, in this case, it can you know, drop in 10 microseconds, up to 10 microseconds. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, this we is can do the questions if you. What? We can do the questions if you if you don't. No, second, I oh. want to. Sorry. System poll. This is for system poll. This is not software poll. We just uh, wait while uh, scheduler just uh, you know wake up us and we can receive packet. In this case, we have about twenty microseconds. This is not very good on, in this case, and yeah. So probably we need to to use some CPU pinning. And, and, and then verify uh, once more. So this is dispersion for this one, and and, uh, and this complete latency. Yeah. So that's it. All right. Questions? Uh, do we have a microphone yet? On up and. <coughs> The, you had uh, the PC generating the packets. Yes. Have you considered the jitter that the traffic generator? Yes. We're, well, there is jitter from there, but the thing is that the jitter would matter on events measurements because on, on the hardware, on the initial hardware that we tested, we didn't have any timestamps. So we didn't check the hardware timestamp from the network interface down to user space. What we tested on the first result, that the results were below two microseconds, was the moment the packet is entering the software stack of the driver down to user space. So the sender jitter doesn't matter in this case. It would obviously matter on Ivan's case where you, uh, it doesn't matter on Ivan's case either because we're only measuring, we're not measuring end-to-end -end latency. Okay. Okay. We're only measuring from the network down to user space. So it doesn't matter what jitter the host introduces, the remote host introduces. The only thing that matters is how much time you need to process the packet from the moment you get it down to your user space application. Okay, so all these measurements are yes. from the... Yes, this is for a single host. Uh, we have plans on doing a cross latency, which obviously what you said will matter okay. uh, to, in order to get end-to-end -end latencies, but we haven't done this yet. Okay, cool. Uh, Paul? So what exactly do you mean by software, Paul? How does it work? Okay, what... Uh, I'll do a bit more technical now. What I, what I meant about no MMIO access on the initial measurements is that you disable the MMIO access. Now, the MMIO access on that hardware resetted the interrupt. So what, ended up, what I ended up doing is that the, the Linux net, network NAPI was already, always called. There was always an interrupt running, right? But since I wasn't measuring network timestamps from the hardware, because the hardware didn't support it. I don't really care if I, if I spam interrupts on the host. I just pick up a timestamp from the moment the packet starts getting processed down to user space. So that, that's, that's what we meant. So the polling means that you, do, you don't have any interrupts enabled. You just poll the queue all the time in order to get the packets as, as fast as they arrive. So you do that in, at a uh, user space level. Yes. Like you constantly. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah, but it's not very power efficient, for yes, example. I know. It's essentially keeps CPU load at 100. I know. That, yeah, that, but that's the idea to uh, minimize latency without paying attention to power. Is that right? Well, you'll have to figure out how much time, how much the interrupt costs for you, because it's a hardware interrupt, and then you have to raise a soft IRQ on the kernel to get the NAPI execution to run and all the things. So you need to figure out. What the, what's the latency of your application? What are you looking for versus what you have? So if, you, if you're looking for sub-20 microseconds, for example, this might be doable with interrupts. But if you're looking for sub-5 microseconds, with the current hardware, this is not doable, at least from what we've seen on the measurements. Essentially, my question, is this software poll mode is intended to be used in production? Or is solely for measurement? <laughs> This is for measurement at the moment. We don't have any production requirements for sub five microseconds. Mm -hmm. So the, the polling mode was just for the measurements that we did. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to end up doing on the, on the industrial environment. And you have a point because you saw what, 20% rise on the CPU temperature when you did polling? Yes. Yeah. About 20. So you, you do have a point, but it all depends on what you're looking on on the application. If you're looking for really low latencies, polling is the only way you can get it at the moment. If you don't really care about ultra-low latencies and you just 
care about, I don't know, sub 40 microseconds or sub 30 or sub 20. This is probably doable with interrupts enabled. Okay, yeah, thank you. I'm just thinking how to adopt this for yeah, Zephyr. I know. <laughs> we can have the talk afterwards. Uh, Ivan, can you please open the slide with uh, the plot for frames versus uh, times? Yeah, this one. This one. So I noted that some, yeah. yeah, the question about the nature of those uh, outliners, like some points, uh, like has uh, much more latency than others, right? So what is the nature of those uh, high latency points? Yeah, actually, we didn't use any CPU pinning, and uh, we have two CPUs only, and uh, actually, it shares the same memory, right? We, we, we don't have uh, you know, NUMA, and we have some applications running in parallel that can access the same memory and, and, and make this make, make this uh, uh, fix. And um, also, we have impact of scheduler. Okay, so, so a, this is because of yeah, scheduler. Okay. Yeah, we, we, we can't avoid this. In uh, order to get the in case of this software, Paul, yeah. th this is system, Paul. Pay attention, it's not software, Paul. We're not falling, we're just waiting on Paul. In order to have the lowest latency, and, and, you have and Maxim had a suggestion for this. He said, do a no-hertz kernel, isolate the CPUs, and pin down the CPUs, you, and pin down different CPUs you want for the user space application. This is so probably he, gonna he get rid. actually several methods for this. You can, you can kind of software pull, do software pull in application, but it doesn't guarantee that your latency is exactly, uh, uh, you know, from, 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 the user, from the driver to the user space. You can, you can have increased latency from the hardware received packet till the moment it leaves driver. So we need to pull also software interrupt, kind of uh, pulling nappy for this, right? And this is complete latency. This is from the very beginning when packet received in the hardware get hardware timestamp and in the software, uh, in software timestamp in the user space. So this is complete, uh, including this uh, software Interrupt impact or out of time. Yeah. Even we're uh, all right. We're out of time. So if you have any questions, you can find either me or Ivan. Thank you.